my name is Tosca Bruno van Pijveken and I work at the Transnational NGO Initiative here in the Moynihan Institute of Global Affairs. Um, we focus on the governance, leadership and effectiveness of transnationally operating NGOs. We do a lot of work with practitioners, leaders and staff in transnational NGOs and every couple of months we have a, a visitor uh, for a day to come and spend some time with us and with you all to talk as practitioners about their challenges as leaders in major organizations. And today we certainly have a major organization. Sophie, when you sent me your bio, um, I took the liberty of adding a few things to it because I want to make sure that that came, came across loud and clear, that is that um, Sophie Delaunay, who is the executive director of MSF US, so MSF, Main Sans Frontier, or Doctors Without Borders, is a global movement. Sophie is the head of the US portion of that. And I felt the need to say on the poster that uh, Médicins Sans Frontières plays a very influential role in global humanitarian relief operations, that its brand name is very strong. It's, I would argue it's one of the strongest brand names in the, um, in the international NGO community. And that its policy stances, as well as its practical stances, so its stances on humanitarian relief globally in its dialogue with, we just talked about WHO, for instance, not, uh, not uh, just less than half an hour ago, and other parts of the system of global governance that takes care of humanitarian relief operations, its policy stances are quite unique and are very strongly articulated, and its practical stances in the field are also quite unique and strongly articulated. And that makes, to me, MSF one of the most interesting transnational NGOs to understand, to study, and uh, also to be helpful to and to work with. Um, Sophie's background is very interesting. She uh, got her master's in political science at um, Yonsei University in Korea. And I asked, maybe during the career talk mm -hmm. this afternoon, which I should also, by the way, advertise at uh, 2.30, am I right? Uh, yes, at 2.30, for those of you who can, for 45 minutes till 3.15. Sophie is um, leading an informal career talk uh, with interested students. And my schedule doesn't tell me where it is, but uh, it says so. It's uh, done in 209 Eggers Hall, and we're doing that together with um, Career Services. So maybe at that time you can talk a little bit how you came to study political science in, in Korea. Um, she also holds a master's degree in international business from Le Havre University in France, where she's from. Um, and she will be talking, has t you worked how long in MSF as a global movement? 22 years. 22 years, which I think from the MSF people I've interacted with is quite common. It's, a, it's almost like a religion, it's like a faith, it's, it's, it's a sect. It's a sect. <laughs> MSF describes itself as a sect or a cult, and I think it has a few of those elements, though not the scary ones. Um, but seriously, today um, Sophie will uh, talk with us about the organization's core identity and its goals, and how it strives to keep a field driven mantra while adapting to the professionalization and the internationalization and the f continued financial growth of MSF globally, and to the fact that the humanitarian uh, uh, challenges on the ground continue to increase in, in complexity. Some of you who were here last year may remember that we had this, the former Secretary General of MSF here, Chris Torgerson, a colleague of Sophie, and Chris introduced me to you, Sophie. So, and we had one of your um, one of your leaders in U.S. operations with us in the Leadership Institute, and I'm proud to say that he is going to be your successor. So um, I, I, I very much am happy with how we're developing the relationship. So over to you. Thank you, Jessica. And thanks for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here with you today in this uh, prestigious uh, um, Maxwell uh, School of Citizenship and Public Affairs of uh, Syracuse uh, University. As Tosca said, I also have the uh, honor of uh, representing and leading uh, MSF, Doctors Without Borders. It's the same organization when we say MSF and uh, Doctors Without Borders in the US. But I thought that uh, um, it would be maybe better to introduce the organization through uh, this short video, which we just uh, produced 
uh, and it would be more pleasant than uh, just a formal institutional presentation so that after I can go straight to exposing the challenges that uh, we face in relation with our identity. So we have the video and then... <coughs> Wearing this T-shirt means that we all engage to follow certain principles laid out in MSF's charter. The principles of independence and impartiality are actually our strongest security measures. So when in the field we are wearing this T-shirt, in a way we are protected because people know that we are outside of the conflict. Médecins Sans Frontières provides impartial help without discrimination and independently of any political powers. We are neutral and we do not take sides in conflicts. We treat our patients with dignity and respect for their cultural and religious beliefs. Impartiality is essential. We treat each patient on the basis of medical need, not on any other criteria. 90% of our budget comes from private donors all over the world. This generous funding gives us freedom to independently choose our actions without interference from political and economic powers. Our work in emergencies often leads us to speak out publicly to highlight forgotten crises, to mobilize other aid organizations, to draw attention to weaknesses in the aid system, to demand access to people trapped in conflict zones, or to campaign for fair access to essential medicines for all. Wearing an MSF t-shirt means being part of a worldwide medical humanitarian organization that speaks out freely and acts with total independence. Okay. So, uh, this was a brief presentation of uh, MSF, and of course, uh, Having a T-shirt doesn't make you an MSF in itself, uh, nor fully protected. But what it means and what we were trying to convey here in this uh, video was that it means you've committed to volunteer, um, to care for others, to adhere to some of the principles that were uh, mentioned in, the, in this video. And also it means also sometimes put yourself at risk, given that we work in highly insecure contexts. But at minima, it means uh, going out, accepting to go out of your comfort zone uh, to help others, uh, because what you are going to experience in the field uh, is going to be hugely challenging from a cultural point of view, from an economic also. It's the conditions of living are not as good as we can have uh, uh, what we can have here, and it means really being exposed to a lot of new challenges that you're going to have to deal with. But. Um, I'd be happy to answer any other questions regarding the organization itself uh, during the Q&A, but what I wanted to focus today was more to share with you some of the, uh, of the challenges that we face in trying to preserve a core, our core identity while uh, constantly adapting to a rapidly evolving environment. 
and especially the, the aid environment has dramatically evolved over the years. Uh, so how, uh, as uh, one French uh, writer, Aragon, was saying, in a changing world, how do you change to remain the same? It's basically the question that we are, we are asking ourselves. So, uh, but what is our identity and what are uh, the values that we care for? Um, I may, um, I, I will focus on two main uh, issues that I think uh, represent MSF quite well. The first one is the, uh, uh, the, the very strong willingness to constantly remain driven by field medical needs. So not being a top-down organization, but a bottom-up. And you will see that it's hugely challenging in, this, uh, in these times. And the second, of course, is in relation <coughs> with the principles that uh, um, you found in this video, the, the traditional uh, in international uh, human law principle, uh, principles of humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, basically and what they mean for us concretely, very practically uh, on the ground, and how we have to sometimes compromise them uh, in order to be able to just do our work, right? So I will start with the uh, uh, field medical needs and how to stay uh, uh, driven. So it sounds obvious that, uh, uh, of course, we want to be driven by medical needs if we are a humanitarian organization and we are actually soliciting uh, the generosity of the public in order to help the others elsewhere. Uh, but in fact, uh, when you look at it, uh, the development uh, uh, in the society, in the economic, in the political environment constantly drives us away from uh, this simple idea of being driven by the field needs. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, one is, for example, the growth of our organization and we were discussing this with Rebecca and Costa earlier. Um, it, 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 we're lucky that we've been a successful organization. In 1971, we were five members, uh, and we're now uh, several thousands of members. We're now almost a $1 billion organization working in 70 country, uh, countries. Um, we are, uh, so it's a very good thing, because what, what it means for us is that we definitely have more capacity. We have more capacity to do quality work on the ground. We don't need to have very basic medical care. Sometimes we actually engage in very sophisticated medical care, like uh, running a burn unit in the middle of Syria. I'm telling you that it's very challenging to keep a high level sterile environment. So you need to be sophisticated. And this growth has allowed us to be more sophisticated and to provide quality care and try to fight this double standard between the North and South. Uh, it's also an opportunity because it allows us to scale up and uh, uh, clearly, you know, the Ebola crisis is a good example of a crisis where we felt alone, but as a result, we also had to scale up constantly and we had the means to do that and we had the support to, to do it. Um, but uh, there are also main threats and risks attached to this growth that we are uh, very concerned and aware about and aware of. Uh, uh, the first one is that by being big, you have much more to lose than when you were a small organization. So when 30 years ago we were uh, running this cross-border <coughs> program, crossing the Pakistan border into Afghanistan, uh, sending a team for six months with donkeys and a bit of drugs and uh, uh, taking care of 20 patients here, 20 patients there. And at some point when we were really tired of being bombed by the Russian uh, occupation army, then we could say, okay, we're going we're gonna to leave. It's not going to have a dramatic impact, right, uh, on the public health of Afghanistan at that time. But we have much more to lose today because imagine that we have a tension with the government of Malawi uh, and that we decide that uh, it is, the situation is unacceptable, it's unacceptable, it means we have to abandon behind us thousands of patients on HIV treatment. So we have much more to lose today. And the growth is a big issue because it means we don't have the same independence as we may have had in the past. This is a risk that we have to keep in mind when we're growing. Another aspect is that 
by becoming a bigger organization, a more global organization, uh, with lots of branches around the world, gives us a lot of capacity, it gives us a lot of uh, cultural diversity, but it also creates more bureaucracy, more layers <coughs> of decision making. And uh, because you need to be harmonized, you need to be organized together, and therefore you have to create layers of reporting, accountability, sharing of information, so that the way you speak about MSF here would be the same uh, in another country, right? You don't want to be perceived as a different organization. You want to keep this, uh, this identity. Also, when you are mushrooming, as MSF has done, there is a, a major risk of uh, duplication. Um, and so there is a tendency to go toward more centralization. Tosca was telling me that she's, you guys have been studying also the governance reform of Save the Children Care. We all went through this kind of governance reform in the, in the past years. And some has, have made some very critical choices of being more centralized, for example. And for MSF, it was uh, a risk that we uh, were very afraid of, becoming a centralized organization with only one decision making. Because we do believe that there is a need for redundancy in a system. Uh, and that most of the innovations that we've been able to create in the field of medical care were made possible because of the decentralized mode of the organization. Because they were, uh, we were not working on all the same guidelines, for example. Um, let me, uh, the, the malnutrition is a very good example to me because we actually had, uh, in the field of malnutrition, we had some protocols that we were using, uh, but one day, one section of MSF decided that uh, it was too labor intensive. Uh, we didn't have a, a strong impact enough on the treatment of malnutrition. It was during the year 2000 when we had a lot of famines in Niger uh, and in Darfur. And so they decided to switch to ambulatory care and to uh, test some products that were coming on the market that were called, uh, maybe you remember the Plumpy Nut, mm -hmm. um, therapeutic, uh, um, I forgot the name. Let's call it Plumpy Nut. It's a pass, it's a peanut pass that you don't need to cook and that you can give to the, to the patient. And it was a magic bullet. Uh, and uh, following this, we not only we had our protocol changed, but all, we also advocated for the WHO and other organizations to change the protocol. And recently, the US government also has admitted that we needed to change the diet for under two year children and that it needed to be protein based, uh, based on this experience with uh, uh, therapeutic food. So, this is to say that in a fully centralized organization, uh, we wouldn't have had the space for this type of development. So, the main issue for us is how uh, to avoid duplication but at the same time uh, make sure that there is sufficient uh, uh, freedom for enterprise, freedom for initiative in the, in the organization. Let me give you another example of how sometimes we go too far in trying maybe to uh, rationalize or centralize. So in the, year, in the past five years we went through this big governance reform and, uh, and there was a, a great concern about duplicating and, uh, and trying to streamline our resources. So it was decided that Actually, uh, some of the uh, branches of MSF would take care of a specific medical issue. And so Ebola and uh, Ebola and hemorrhagic fever, uh, it, it was decided for, this, for Ebola and hemorrhagic fever that the Belgian office would take care of it. So they would be the ones to, to learn, to study, to develop the expertise for the whole movement. Uh, and that was all fine until we had the major Ebola outbreak in West Africa uh, in March last year. So of course the Belgium, they knew a lot, they started to uh, be involved. And, uh, but the fact that the others had not built their own capacity took them several months to be fully operational. So it's a big lesson that we learned, because in fact, if we had had a bit more redundancy and having two operational centers studying, learning, developing some skills around Ebola, we would have been able to scale up much more quickly. And maybe also because when, when two um, operational centers are, are developing things on their own, there is a healthy competition between them. And so we might even have had some innovation coming out of it. 
that does not happen if you are the only one and the leader in a specific uh, environment. So this is a lesson we learned, but don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating for free for all and uh, uh, duplication, uh, uh, absolutely. I'm just saying that uh, there are some uh, theoretical frameworks uh, that practically are not uh, so uh, convenient when it comes to the reality of the situations we face. <coughs> Another example in terms of uh, being driven by, so this example was very much an internal one challenge that MSF faces internally. But we also, uh, we are also struggling with huge problems, uh, external ones, uh, when something is not being driven by the field needs. And research and development is one of them. It's a very relevant issue for us, because we consider today that research and development is absolutely not driven by field needs, but by by medical needs, but it's driven by profit, which actually creates uh, a huge amount of gaps in the in the system. So, um, because since there is no uh, public health leadership to guide the priorities to address address people's health needs, uh, particularly in developing countries, our current model only prioritizes the uh, the development of blockbuster products. Uh, that generate maximum sales, and even if they are superfluous from a medical uh, standpoint. Um, for example, consider the shocking statistics that over 80% of new medicine uh, that is provide, provide no added uh, therapeutic value to compare to what exists in the market today. So, um, meanwhile, you have a lot of gaps in the field. Our medical teams are struggling constantly with a, a killer disease like tuberculosis, malaria, uh, Kalaza, Chagas, uh, which is a, another neglected tropical disease. And this disease kills millions every year. Actually, Chagas kills more every year than Ebola killed in West Africa recently. Uh, but for this disease, there is a very severe lack of diagnostic tool, of effective drug and vaccine. And, uh, and when these uh, medicine or tools exist, they are very poorly adapted to the field. So they require high technology, they are not uh, easy to manipulate in the environments where we work. And when there is a new drug, and uh, when some drugs do present a, a medical breakthrough, uh, they tend most of the time to be unaffordable. Case in point is uh, Gilead's new hepatitis C drug. I don't know if you've heard about that, but for many, many years we've really suffered from a lack of effective, efficient drug for hepatitis C, which was killing millions of people. Now we have a fantastic drug. The problem is that it is priced at $84,000 uh, in the US for 12 weeks treatment. And the price, of course, has provoked uh, both uh, private insurers and government programs to ration the treatment, while, of course, this remains completely out of reach for the million of people uh, living with hepatitis C in developing countries, including in our own programs. Uh, Ebola illustrates another type of failure when uh, uh, actually the, the, the need is not uh, driving uh, the thinking and the public health policies. Um, in order to effectively prepare for and tackle Ebola, we needed a system that would invest in research and development for uh, uh, Ebola between, in between outbreaks uh, and to have drug and vaccines candidates ready so that when there is the outbreak, you can test them because you still need patients anyway to test. So, um, ironically, in the case of Ebola, it turned out that uh, we do have several drugs and vaccine candidates for Ebola. Um, and we, we have known about them for, for some time. But the problem is that their uh, development was largely uh, uh, supported by public funds, so it's important to know because the day you will see that a new drug for Ebola is found but is priced at $84,000, you can challenge it because it was funded by private, private funded init, uh, funds initially. Um, but what happened was that because it was primarily uh, developed for di defense purpose, and when uh, uh, it, was be it became clear that Ebola is actually hard to transmit, you have to be very sick to transmit uh, Ebola, uh, then it was abandoned. 
and it's only recently that uh, we've been able to engage in clinical trials uh, in order to test the drugs. But the time the whole system gets on its feet, uh, now we have uh, less patients, which make the clinical trial irrelevant. And my, uh, my take from this is that we may actually uh, end up with uh, clinical trials which are going to be not conclusive and, uh, and not be ready and equipped for the next outbreak of Ebola, which really highlights the failure of the uh, research and development uh, system. So, um, it's clear that uh, uh, today the, the, the market is not driven by the needs, the medical market, and for us it's a huge challenge because we can't treat our patients uh, in the field, but it's driven uh, by profit and, uh, and our patients are, are dying as a, as a result. Um, now, the second point uh, in relation to our uh, identity was around this uh, principle, so you've heard independence, impartiality, um, neutrality. We've used these principles so often that I actually like not to use them today and I'd like to give you what they mean to me, actually. Um, I think that for us, uh, one major principle is really adhering to medical ethics and do no harm. It's the do no harm principle, which is very much re in relation with impartiality, but uh, I'm sure it speaks more to you. And do no harm, it means that uh, not only you need to practice good <coughs> medicine, but also you are, you are facing situations sometimes when it's actually more harmful to treat than not. Let me give you an example. Um, after the collapse of uh, the Gaddafi regime in Libya, um, the opposition or the new government was really happy working with MSF because we've been, uh, we had been present during the, during the war and helping a, a, a lot of people. <coughs> and uh, we got authorization to work in the prisons where uh, there was a very high uh, incidence of tuberculosis and lots of health problems. So we started to work in prisons, uh, soon to realize that we were actually being asked to uh, fix patients between torture sessions. And so uh, despite a lot of advocacy, we were not able to convince uh, the authorities of the prison and the local authorities that for us it was absolutely unacceptable and we decided to leave, to withdraw. So it's an example where we believe at this stage that uh, providing medical care was actually perpetuating a system that was doing, that was harmful. And we don't want to be um, complicit of this. Um, uh, another intangible principle <coughs> for us is that we know we're working in very, uh, operating in very unhealthy environment where you have lots of bad guys with a lot of politics uh, and so we're very much conscious of the risk of diversion uh, and this is something and, and we have a principle that we don't want to uh, feed the war, we don't want to perpetuate the conflict but at the same time we all know that uh, of course you know you <coughs> cannot guarantee that a hundred percent of your aid is going to reach the most vulnerable. So how do you go about that? These are, uh, uh, these are issues. And um, a third principle would be that um, we consider, even though we're not a risk-averse organization, we operate in very highly insecure contexts. Uh, the social contract prevails over the social mission for us, which means that we want to operate, we want to provide care, but we don't want it to be at the expense of the life of our own people. This is why in certain circumstances, after a kidnapping has occurred, and if, we're not, if we have lost trust in the ability of the power at play to guarantee our security, we would withdraw, even though we know there are huge needs. When we left Somalia uh, last year, uh, it was not because we considered we had finished the job and uh, actually there were, we, we created a very big gap in the already very weak health system in Somalia. But it was because we, we thought it was much too dangerous for our people. And we did the same in Syria after the kidnapping of our, uh, of our team in uh, ISIS control, uh, control territory when uh, we couldn't get a, a strong guarantee an agreement that they would not target us anymore. 
So this is to say that uh, it's a principle we, of course, we're still taking risks, but uh, uh, it's a principle that, that uh, is important to us. And last but not least is the principle of independence. But more importantly, the ability as an organization to keep its capacity of judgment. Because if you want to make a decision based on what, based on diversion of aid, if you want to decide to withdraw from a prison in Libya, you need to be really independent. You cannot be financially dependent from government who wants you to be there, and you cannot be independent from uh, political, uh, you, you have to be independent from political, judicial, uh, or, uh, or military influence or religious, even, influence. So these principles are important, but uh, we're also pragmatic. And uh, we know that we're not living in an ideal world. Uh, we also know that uh, sometimes the best intentions do not result in the best outcomes from the population, and that it's the civilians who always uh, bear the first, uh, the, the, the major, uh, uh, who suffer the most. They are the first victim in, in the conflicts. And so for us, reaching those civilians uh, usually leads to compromises to our, to our principles. We have to compromise. We have no choice. Um, because we're dealing with bad, bad guys, and we need to accept that in order for them to accept our presence, they need to see an interest in us being there. If they don't see any interest, then they, why would they accept us as witness uh, in those environment? So this this you have to to access and, and to accept and uh, it's uh, and sometimes in our history we had to make some compromises like not speaking out uh, because we knew we would be kicked out of the country and we felt that uh, the added value in providing medical care was bigger than the added value of speaking out uh, in certain circumstances. So this is why we need we we need to be um, pragmatic. Um, we also need to be very opportunistic sometimes. So let me give you the example of uh, in, uh, in 2009, during the last military offensive in uh, Sri Lanka, um, we were the only organization uh, present very close to the battlefield and we witnessed uh, very, very serious uh, violence against civilians. We could see it from a medical standpoint because the people we were receiving were really, really uh, in bad shape, but and we were providing a lot of surgical uh, uh, care to them. Um, outraged by the situation, the team wanted to speak out, and the Sri Lankan government made it clear that if we spoke out, we were out of the country. And so we have been facing this dilemma of, do we speak out, and our conscience will, will feel better, but at the same time we're not going to be able to provide life-saving care to hundreds of people. And so what we decided at that time, after intense internal debate, was not to speak out, uh, but to continue to work in those circumstances and then to close the hospital as soon as we would have treated all the, all the people, which we did. Um, what was made possible at that time was that actually ICRC had spoken about this violence. So we felt that uh, adding MSF voice would not be such an added value. So there, there are always some opportunities that we say, you know, um, a bit like when we decided in 1994 to uh, uh, evacuate uh, Goma. Uh, in, at that time it was called Zaire because we realized that the camp was under the control of the uh, militias, the Rwandese militias, uh, and the aid was totally diverted. It was in, in the middle of a cholera outbreak. and But we decided to leave because we really didn't want the aid to be diverted or our aid, but also because we knew there were hundreds of other NGOs who are staying. You know, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm saying that because I don't want us to look too, uh, you know, we're, we're better than others and we have a higher morality. It's not, it's not the case. Yes, we had the guts to say no, enough is enough, but at the same time, it was made possible by the fact that others were doing the job. And if we had been alone in Goma, I don't know if we would have taken this decision and abandoned thousands of people. This I don't know. Um, however, sometimes we make some pragmatic decisions uh, or some very principled decisions and they have a very strange uh, adverse effect. Let me give you one example. Some years ago when we were still in Somalia, 
uh, we were working in Danile, uh, a hospital uh, in the suburbs of Mogadishu, and this area was under the control of the Al Shabab. And uh, the Shabab uh, asked us for some taxes. So it's okay, we pay taxes. I mean, the US, I pay taxes. Everywhere we, uh, we work, we pay taxes. But the level of taxes that they were asking, knowing that they don't do anything in terms of social safety net for the population, sounded to us much too high. And so we refused. Um, but what happened was that uh, we expected that then the hospital would have to close and uh, would have to leave. But the hospital say, and we realized that our staff, our Somali staff, in order to keep the hospital, which was uh, a lifeline for the population, uh, they decided to collect the money and pay the shiba themselves. So uh, just to say that sometimes you feel you're very principled, but you don't realize the, the consequence that it can have on the, on the communities. Uh, I, really, I, I cannot talk about these principles without uh, talking about the military because we have a, it's a very good example of how we're trying to navigate this balance, this tension between being principles and, and pragmatic. So uh, in conflicts, um, we want to avoid at any cost the perception of being affiliated with one party to the conflict, with one military. Um, because otherwise it's absolutely impossible to reach oppositions, opposition areas where usually the needs are, are the highest. So we always keep a healthy distance with the military. We have a no weapon policy in our health facilities. We try not to meet with the military or, or very discreetly. Uh, and if so, we meet with all the parties anyway. For example, in the, in the in DRC, in the Congo, uh, we, we work with the MINUSCO, we have meetings, but we don't go out drinking with MINUSCO uh, uh, soldiers, etc. Um, because, because they are de, de facto, even they are UN forces, they are de facto party to the conflict because they support the Congolese forces. So we cannot be seen as neutral. At the, at the same time, in non-conflict areas, we recognize the role uh, and the effectiveness of the army, it's obvious. I was, I've been working in China for many years, and every year there were floods in several provinces in China. Every year we were sending a small exploratory mission on the part of MSF, but every year we came to the same conclusion that the Chinese military was much better equipped than we were to respond to those floods. So it's a, it, it is obvious. And uh, in an environment like... Um, um, where there is no conflict, we do recognize the role of the U.S. military, of, of the military, to the point that during the Ebola outbreak, we actually ask for military assets to be deployed on the ground to the U.K. and the U.S. because we consider that we needed a strong chain of command and that only the military was able to provide this. We needed strong logistics, only the military was able to provide this, and we needed people trained in biosafety issue and trained in working in highly infectious environment and only the military has invested in this type of, uh, of skills. And so this is to say that we can be something, it's hard for the public to understand how can we be so principled that you don't even want to talk to the military in a conflict but then you're going to make a call for military assets in Liberia. What, the, what does it mean? Well, for us it's very clear. Just like in Haiti during the earthquake, um, we actually referred some patients to the Navy hospital Navy ship that the U.S. had. They had a very sophisticated hospital, and at some point it became obvious that uh, uh, if you wanted to so save the patient, it made sense to actually refer it to a, to a military hospital. So this is the pragmatism and how we, we navigate uh, it. I lost my, uh, my other points. Okay. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to, to talk a bit about independence because none of these choices and judgments would be possible if we were not independent. So what does independence mean for us? It means that, uh, uh, first of all, we are financially independent from the government. We rely mostly on private funding, and we've also diversified our funding. So the U.S. is a major player in, uh, in terms of private funding, but we also collect money from uh, uh, 19 other countries in the world. 
And that makes us independent, because when there is a crisis in the US, uh, then we can continue our operations thanks to the money we collect in Australia and Hong Kong. When there is a crisis in Greece and Spain, as was the case last year, we are able to benefit from the good results in the US. So this diversity uh, and the fact that we mostly collect unearmarked funding, so we try not to have restricted funding, we try to uh, educate the donors to make them understand that the reason why we are so agile and so quick to respond is because we don't have to wait for to send a proposal to a government to get the money for the operations, but that we have unearmarked funding that we can use and as the, the crisis gets more visibility and media attention, then we can collect more funding that will help us both for the current program and for um, uh, the future program. It was all the more important during the Ebola outbreak that not to, to try to limit the amount of restricted funding because Ebola was all over the media. And, uh, and actually we've benefited from uh, great generosity of the public. The problem was, in the meantime, we had operations that, that were twice the size of the Ebola response in Central African Republic, in Syria, in South Sudan. And nobody was talking about them. So if we were only to rely on unrestricted funding, we would have been overfunded for Ebola and underfunded for others. This is why it's so important for us, and this is what makes our, our independence. And the good thing about independence is that it has a virtuous impact because it creates the perception and it strengthens the perception that you're not affiliated with someone. If you are independent financially from governments, uh, it has a very strong impact in Pakistan and Afghanistan when you say you don't receive funding from governments, especially the governments that are part of the coalition. So this is a means for us. Independence is not such a, it's not so much a principle, but it's a means to operate and be able to. Of course, it doesn't mean that you don't collaborate. As I said, we are um, in, uh, in non-conflict times, we, we collaborate. We've had a very close collaboration with the CDC, for example, during the Ebola outbreak. They've done all our laboratory work. We've sent every sample to, to the CDC. They were doing the lab. Um, and uh, there are many other uh, circumstances when we collaborate with, uh, with other entities. So, just to finish, so that... What time is it? Okay. We're good? Just, yeah, we're good. We have time okay. until about um, 4 to 2 time. So yeah. to two, because I imagine some of you might want to ask some one-on-one -on -one questions and at 2 o'clock yeah. we're recording a few brief interviews for a website that you can view later on. Okay, so maybe I will conclude here and then we can have a, a Q&A. So, uh, what would I hope you would take from, uh, uh, from this talk? Um, first is that each organization uh, has its own identity. Uh, and I think it's really important to have a distinguished identity. Uh, it would be absolutely terrible if uh, all organizations in the aid system had exactly the same ethos. And uh, uh, So I, I don't think MSF is, is so different from others. I think every, every organization has its own... Uh, uh, MSF claims to be different, and MSF cultivates this difference. Uh, but um, if you are different from others, it means others are different from you, right? So, and too often, there is a risk also that... Uh, um, as the aid system has expanded, as organizations have proliferated, as the humanitarian crises are so broad and so complex, because in a humanitarian crisis you don't just have a health issue, you have a social issue, you have criminal issues, you have legal issues, you have economic issues, you have education issues. A lot of organizations have actually been trapped, in my view, in trying to do just everything, which does dilute your identity. And, uh, and that's a problem because then you have, uh, your brand is not as strong if you yourself, you cannot define yourself. You know, for us it's quite easy, it's medical acute crisis, very acute crisis and medical emergencies. Um, but if you do a bit of everything, social work, education, uh, health, you lose the expertise. And this is a problem we face more and more is that in acute emergencies we have less and less actors able to respond because they have 
invested so many resources in development, in long term, etc., and they, they have lost some uh, core capacity in responding to uh, acute emergencies. But also it, it creates another problem, which is that uh, it uh, removes the responsibility from those who should be responsible. So if you do a bit of everything, uh, you are actually, uh, if you as a donor decide that you're going to be more involved also in setting up the agenda, and we're talking about the Gates, organized, uh, the Gates Foundation earlier, uh, then you remove the responsibility for, from the state, you remove the responsibility from the WHO. And everyone has a role to play, but everyone has a specific role to play, and not every role to play. So for MSF, our role, we consider, is to provide quality medical care in a situation when there is a huge gap, but not to subsidize the Ministry of Health, not to be the Ministry of Health of the, of the world, and, and our goal is to be there for a given time and then being able to leave when the crisis is over so that the ministries can take their responsibility back. Uh, but we're not a donor, so we're not granting to other organizations. We're a, a practitioner, a medical practitioner, and we don't, we don't have qualification in other areas like uh, development, education, and so on and so forth. We consider that there are plenty of other organizations who can do that. So this is what I mean by really, uh, um, I think it's key to the success of an organization to keep uh, reaffirming who we are, what, what we can do and what we cannot do, and uh, cultivate its own identity based on, uh, on uh, uh, what, it, what it is that uh, uh, triggered the, the emergence of the organization. The, um, the second point I'd like uh, uh, to conclude with is that uh, identity, values, principles, if you want them to be practical, you need to look at them uh, in the context where we are at this given moment. Because the principle of independence it didn't mean the same 34 years ago than it means for us today. Uh, independence uh, uh, several years ago, it meant being able to cross borders. Uh, into another country. Uh, we were called MSF without borders. It was the time of the uh, droit uh, d'ingérence created by Bernard Kouchner. It was a time when uh, there were lots of uh, failing states. But now it's no longer the case. It never happened that we cross border illegally. Uh, it has only happened recently uh, in Syria, but it was not even illegal. We couldn't do it without the uh, agreement of the Turkish government. So independence is no longer that for us. For us, independence today is deciding not to seek funding from the Gates Foundation so that we can challenge the Gates Foundation, for example. And so uh, this is what I mean by those principles. They, are, they can be intangible, but they need to look at uh, in the context where you operate. And they need to be looked at in a very practical way, not in a theoretical way and, uh, and moralist way in any sense. Um, the third point uh, is that uh, economic growth for an organization, and I know it's strange to say that in the US because growth is considered in the US as it's not a disease, but in MSF it's considered as a disease. <laughs> uh, it's an opportunity, but it's as much an opportunity as a threat. For, uh, especially for a grassroots organization. And same is professionalization. Um, there is, as we grow, there is major pressure for, uh, it was someone for, from Harvard actually who, who, who told me this, uh, uh, this, this term that I really loved and she said, uh, meta-cannibalistic processes. Uh, and yes, we are there, you know, this constant search for five-year plan, master plans, monitoring, evaluation, KPIs, data, etc. It's a, uh, it's really a trend that challenges the grassroots spirit and the action. And we need to resist and we ch to challenge them. We need to have good tools to be more efficient, but we constantly need to wonder whether uh, they are taking you further away from uh, the reality of the field uh, or whether they are actually a tool that makes you better in the work you do. Uh, and I know it's a... Um, it's, it's, I don't want to create a sense that, you know, you should... Uh, 
get rid of uh, all the of the, all the tools and all the theory, but uh, clearly I think that we are in a in a situation today where we're completely overwhelmed for the name in the name of accountability with a lot of bureaucracy uh, that makes us forget what is it exactly that would make a difference for the people that we care for. Uh, finally. Because I'm an NGO, I would just like to say that uh, uh, NGO they play a role in the in the crisis, and as such, we have a responsibility, and we're accountable for our choices. And when MSF decides not to grow or to grow in a certain direction, or intervene or not intervene, uh, we need to be accountable for. Uh, we need to be accountable for the quality and the impact of our of our action on the field, and more importantly, if especially if you talk about identity and core values. What is most important is to be able to do what you claim you are. So if you claim that you are uh, uh, an organization that is transparent, then you need to be able to expose publicly your internal challenges and your, uh, your ethical choices. Uh, but also, because you're in the field of public affairs, I think it's important to acknowledge that the role of humanitarian action is limited. It is limited to temporarily alleviating suffering. It's very important because we're not here to change the world. We're just here to give a chance of survival and a chance of regaining the capacity of choice for some people, but not to uh, uh, create peace or to change the world in, in, in any way. Because uh, ultimately, this suffering is the product of political decisions, and it's going to be solved by political, political decisions, not by humanitarian action. Uh, Humanitarian action is apolitical in the sense that uh, it does not carry uh, a political project for a society, and nor does it claim to uh, to replace the um, uh, the existing powers. So uh, the, the the act of uh, bringing relief for us is just an attempt to to, res to restore a space of humanity and. Uh, uh, and dignity and normality in something that is abnormal and temporary. And so our main goal in everything we, we do is actually to hope that uh, the states will and the powers will ultimately restore this, uh, this normality in the context. And just to uh, put us back in a very specific role that is a minimal one, which is one actor in the middle of a much more bigger environment. We'll stop here. Thank you for listening and uh, I'm happy to have you. Okay. Who would like to? Hi, <laughs> my name is Isabella. Um, uh, I thought it was interesting what you said about um, like the organizations that concentrate on a very specific mandate versus trying to do everything. Um, but then how do you deal with in a humanitarian context where you still need to be aware of an issue that's like multifaceted. Like, mm. So it's funny, we were discussing, we were in the humanitarian action class with uh, Professor Bettini, who is from the WFP, and we were writing a paper on gender-based violence. And um, there, for instance, there's like a medical component mm. in responding to gender-based violence, but then there are lots of other components. Mm. So how do you then deal with being specialised but still co coordinating mm -hmm. to make sure that you that you like that you're a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very good that's a very good point because it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, so what we try to do first and foremost is to make sure that the other components are uh, met by others. Right. Sometimes they're not, mm -hmm. and so that is difficult. But uh, we really try to resist the temptation of going too broad or it would be. Because in, in our history, we've tried, we've actually worked a lot on, a, uh, I, I remember I opened a program on, for street children in China. You know, it's very far from uh, medical uh, emergencies. And it was fascinating, and I, I still have, you know, uh, it was a great program actually, I think. But it was not something that after, when I left this program, my peers in MSF wanted to perpetuate. Because it's not in the culture. So you actually take a, so I was lucky because this program was taken over by the Chinese staff. They created their own NGO and they're still running it. So we're, we're lucky in that regard. But uh, 
there was no ownership in the organization around this type of program. It was too far from the skills we have. Um, so it's only uh, uh, exceptionally that we would cover other uh, areas. Most of the time we'll try to work with uh, authorities and with uh, other organizations to uh, do so. Just to give you an example, after the war, um, uh, in Liberia, uh, after the war, we, stay for, we stayed for some times, for several years, and there was a major issue around uh, sexual violence in Liberia, major issue, which was really, during the war, there's been a lot of sexual violence, and with the economic condition deteriorating after the war, uh, it has actually continued. It was just a practice that you couldn't get rid of. And so we opened uh, a program uh, with a medical and psychological care component, and we worked with the Ministry of Justice to actually, uh, they were criminalizing uh, sexual violence, and we were providing the, uh, the medical component to it. So uh, it was something that, and gradually they took over uh, through the Ministry of Health, the whole medical component of uh, sexual violence. I'd like how you discussed trying to resist bureaucratizing and professionalizing your organization. As an intern for OJA, I saw how MSF is given that platform to articulate your principles at that scale. But I was wondering, on the ground level, how involved is MSF with the cluster system or providing that kind of feedback to these other huge players on the ground? And whether you actively do that or if you're just kind of sucked in by OJA's gravitational pull, I'll call it. So some years ago, we've decided that we would um, we were com uh, we were completely absorbed by all these platforms, coalitions, alliances, to the point that uh, a lot of our resources were um, used, you know, taken away from the fields in order to do that. So we decided to stop being uh, to withdraw from each of these coalitions and to engage in a very opportunistic manner and bilateral manner with actors. So when we have something to say to OCHA or to WFP, we go and talk to them. But we're not gonna go to these meetings uh, and, uh, and try to have uh, these big statements that uh, are actually represent the lowest common denominator because nobody has the same goal in, the, in this room, nor the same interest. But this being said, when it, when it comes to the clusters and the coordination in the field, We've, um, we've never uh, taken a strong distance from them. We've asked not to be a formal member, but to be an observer. Uh, and we still attend each of them, because we're, we're a major player, and uh, you know, it wouldn't make sense that uh, they don't know what we do, and we don't know what they do. We don't want to duplicate, uh, and we want to be able also to raise our concerns if there are some gaps in the system. So we actively participate in all the coordination meetings with other NGOs. We work very closely with the ministries of health in every single country where we work. And, um, but sometimes we also have to, uh, uh, to say, well, sorry, but uh, it doesn't make sense. So if we know that nothing is gonna happen, uh, because you know there is a poor leadership in, in this uh, cluster, and uh, in that case, we're gonna do our own. I remember uh, at the beginning of the uh, Haiti earthquake in 2010, um, it was chaos, and uh, I mean, to their credit, the UN was completely decimated. They had lost all their uh, heads, so the coordination was very poor, and there was this tsunami of NGOs coming to, to Haiti. I think at that time there were 250 NGOs in, in a couple of weeks. And so the UN were trying just to find a room to accommodate those 250 NGOs to have a coordination meeting. We couldn't wait for this to happen, right? Especially you had a, a lot of NGOs that were of little value and li limited capacity in this context. So what we did was that we created our own cluster coordination with the big five. We took Save the Children, Oxfam, MSF, Médecins du Monde, I think, and Action contre la Faim. And uh, we met in our own uh, office and we actually shared the work. And said, okay, who's gonna do what? And because we knew we covered anyway uh, among ourselves, 75% of the needs. So it's very, I would say, practical and opportunistic again. Although, I, yeah, I think it makes perfect sense the way you are 
explain it. I, ha I do have a sense from some other NGOs that they sometimes, uh, and you know this, um, resent MSF for it, right? For that stance that mm. you take, that they say it's either it's perceived to be arrogant or it's perceived to be go it alone, it's perceived to be <coughs> cowboy mentality, the way sometimes Greenpeace is also looked at by, by others. And yet what you say makes is perfectly rational in its own right. And the other perception mm. stand, they, they, yeah. they, they both stand. But the thing is that, you know, um, it's, ne it's not fun to be perceived as uh, arrogant and cowboy, but honestly, we don't care. We, what we're here for <laughs> is, to, is to provide assistance. So when you are in a cluster that is completely rigid, and because an NGO has been assigned this region, but there is a population dis displacement 20 kilometers away from this region, and the NGO doesn't go because they have not been allocated this region. We don't care. We get out of our allocated area, and we go there and we assist the people. Yeah. And we say, sorry, but uh, we're not going to adhere to a system that is not needs-driven, right. right? Or that is too rigid. So yeah. um, it, it's always justified. It's never... A a posture. It's never a political it's posture. It's ego. No, it's really when uh, because we actually use this system a lot when it serves us, right? It's just when we realize it's not helpful, well, it's not practical. Let's not use it. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? What kind of uh, activities are you providing in countries without humanitarian crisis? And in particular, do you provide medical assistance in developed countries, for example, for people who do not have access to uh, national healthcare systems in France, in Spain, for example? It's a very good question. Um, we try to focus mostly on conflicts, so uh, if, even conflicts in uh, in quite developed countries. We are uh, we have operations in Ukraine mm -hmm. at the moment because there are some populations who are definitely deprived from access to healthcare. Now, in, in more stable environments, we would focus on uh, critical medical issues, mm -hmm. such as uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis, mm -hmm. uh, HIV AIDS, uh, or the, those neglected tropical diseases that I uh, referred to earlier, uh, like Chagas, Kalahasa, or... Um, because we see that... Uh, it, uh, and the criteria for intervention uh, would not be conflict, uh, but would be uh, the, the neglected nature mm. of it. Mm. When really nobody cares and it's killing millions of people. This is what would drive our operations. We would not intervene in uh, just uh, for the sake of uh, restoring access to healthcare mm -hmm. in a developed country. Um, because most of the time we consider that uh, this government has the means actually to do it. And so as much as we are ready to fill gaps, we don't want to uh, uh, de-responsibilize governments from, uh, mm -hmm. from, mm -hmm. from this. So we've been looking at the United States, for example. We've done a few exploratory missions because there are a lot of people who are uh, deprived from access to health care. Um, but we could never find the niche that would have made our uh, operations relevant. Not to mention the fact that uh, the cost per patient for us uh, would have been enormous in the United States because of all the liability or all the insurance insurances that you need to take, etc. But my question was, oh, yeah, I noticed from the video it mentioned uh, denial of health care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that would have to do with, uh, could be amongst other people who are at, uh, as a result of stigma, societal stigma. Mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. So those populations you do serve, yeah. but primarily in countries that also have conflict. Yeah, but not, not necessarily, only. for example, tuberculosis in prison, because we consider it a, it's a severe de denial of health care. So there are some marginalized groups that don't receive uh, assistance. Other questions? In your closing, you speak to uh, the the final justification for MSF's work, which is to to fill in that spot during a crisis, during a conflict specifically, when the civilians and I, and, and I think this is the idealized version of who you serve are those who are not directly involved in the conflict. Uh, of course, you serve everybody, right? But mm -hmm. Ideally, it's it's the people who are caught.
caught in the crosswire, mm -hmm. crosshairs, right? Uh, crossfire. And if you're doing your job right in, in the middle of this conflict and you're saving lives, at the end of the day, does MSF ever feel concerned that in reducing the body count, you're also reducing the motivation that political bodies as well as the global public might have to press for what you say should be the final solution, which are political solutions to political problems, right? Are you not taking away, through a just means, the, the final motivation for, for political mm -hmm. action? Mm -hmm. I'm totally confident that it's not the case. And the reason is that uh, we've already we've always maintained our dual mandate, self-given mandate, mm -hmm. which is not just medical care but speaking out. And most of the time, by our presence, we are the ones to actually call for a political solution. You are shedding a light on the suffering of these people. So if we're not there, I my I'm absolutely sure that people are going to be even more neglected. And therefore, uh, this does not prompt for uh, a political solution. And you know, let's be modest. We're not uh, uh, saving lives by uh, millions. We're doing uh, something like 150,000 uh, deliveries a year. But it's good because it's 150,000 uh, complicated deliveries. So it would have been 150,000 babies or mothers who would have died. We have. Uh, uh, we do about 8 million consultations a year, about 100,000 uh, surgeries. Um, I think at this stage we might have 30,000 people under ART for HIV. So we're not talking about millions that would make a difference, you know, uh, that would change the, uh, uh, the current balance in, the, in, the, in conflict and in the war. I don't think so. Are you skeptical? I wonder. Yeah. I really wonder. I also wonder about... Uh, the growth of the enterprise, as you point out, you've grown tremendously in 30 years. And in doing this work and expanding to do this work in 30 years, it seems to me that it must be the case that demand for your services has grown. Mm -hmm. And that if the world is broken, then perhaps the world is more broken. Yeah. And so then we wonder how, how to fix the broken. And especially if it's getting worse. Those of you, are the students in the classroom to take Professor Dayton's conflict course? What do the data say about <laughs> oh, people gosh. impacted yeah. by conflicts? <laughs> I don't even remember. I know I learned it last semester. So mm -hmm. We looked at a lot of data. Do you want to tell us about the course? Please do. <laughs> So I'm swimming in so it's about to check this data. I, if it's true, I, people yeah. are actually I think impacted. the questions are open. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Rebecca, is your point that, for example, uh, I think there are uh, over 3 million uh, refugees from Syria in neighboring countries. If we actually did nothing for them, uh, it would make it impossible for the political, for the governments not to find a political solution. I would never suggest that you do not help those people. Because I found it a bit maltreated. This is oh no no this is the <laughs> this this is the uh, the question and the critique from people who very comfortably sit in ivory towers. Yeah. Right. Uh, but those people can sometimes have really interesting questions, mm -hmm. and I know MSF to be particularly partial to considering those problems, mm -hmm. uh, even in among itself. This is exactly the question: yeah. is if MSF had been around during the Holocaust and had helped people. Mm -hmm. Would we have addressed the matter the way we did? I think the, part, the answer on scale answered that question clearly. Right? The scale that MSF back then or now would have achieved would not have been substantial in that consideration amongst the political forces. Okay, I, I take your point on scale. I do take your point on scale. Uh, consider the folks who donate to MSF, which is larger than your 150,000 deliveries, I think, and larger than your million operations, 100,000 operations. Yeah. If those people did not assuage their consciences, consciences right, by, by donating to MSF and they instead, this is going a little far in the American case, but they instead, they instead wrote letters to, to yeah. their representatives, could more lasting change not be brought about? Mm -hmm. Except what do we know about the data in terms of, is it true that people who give money do not also write? Yeah. I don't know that we 
Yeah. We don't know. No. Yeah. And we don't know. But it's very interesting, mm -hmm. tantalizing yeah. questions. Yeah. We have a question here. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, how independent, independent way the semester um, provides assistance in a country, in a certain country where um, I think this government like kind of like wants to control like what mm -hmm. MS uh, does within the country and what kind of like strategy or ways that um, MS has kind of used to convince this kind of government. I'm mean, like talking about Korea. Mm -hmm. You know a lot about Korea. North Korea? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yes, that's why you know the independence. It means a lot of different things depending on uh, on what you're looking at. So uh, fully, it's true that we're very much independent financially. But when it comes to uh, crossing borders or working in a country, we completely recognize the sovereignty of this country. And so, in most of the countries where we work, we would have a memorandum of understanding that defines uh, the roles and obligations. Of, uh, of MSF and that defines the scope of operations. What is clear is that when we um, uh, we would we never have a problem uh, a, a program uh, before having uh, assessed the needs. And so, if we identify needs and needs that we can respond to, we will then propose offer our services to the Ministry of Health. If they don't want us to do that, but they want us to do something else, uh, it's, it's rare that we would compromise our independence. If we don't think that what they're asking responds to a need, we're not going to do it. And if they don't want us to work in this area, we're going to push and push, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. In Myanmar, we haven't been able to work for many years, right? We wanted to do some malaria work in Myanmar. In some uh, states of Myanmar, we've not been able. But we have not compromised on that, you know. They just wanted to work us to work in Rangoon. It was not a, there was no added value for MSF. Uh, in the case of North Korea, it's very different because North Korea for us has been uh, the uh, uh, as exemplified uh, the most sophisticated diversion of aid that you can think of because it's actually the system that diverts it, the system that discriminates its population. And, uh, and so uh, the, the, the aid, which is channeled through the public distribution system, is not reaching the most vulnerable. It's most reaching the most loyal, because it's a class system. And so what we did in North Korea is uh, we responded in 1995 to an appeal from the North Korean government following floods. But in fact, the flood was a, an alibi, because the country was uh, bankrupt. Uh, following the collapse of the Soviet uh, bloc. Uh, but anyway, so we intervened. We were the first international organization to actually put a foot inside North Korea. Uh, we realized that uh, the needs were immense. Uh, the, the health system had totally collapsed. But for three years, we tried unsuccessfully to uh, get access and to have control over our aid. And we have failed. The North Korean government never agreed to let us have a permanent presence in the hospital, to let us distribute the food ourselves. Instead, it was going through the public distribution system. So after three years of uh, not being able to uh, reach an agreement, we decided to leave because we considered that we were doing more harm than good by actually strengthening a system that uh, discriminates and, uh, and uh, starves its population. And we had, at that time, we had very uh, uh, aggressive, I would say, conversations with, uh, with other NGOs who were absolutely convinced that uh, it was the opposite, uh, the, the, they, they were right to choose the opposite stance, which was, we have to stay in North Korea because, yes, we're going to strengthen the system, but when they are all fed, then the most vulnerable will also get the support. But when you look at North Korea today, uh, actually, the system has been strengthened, and people in the camps and people in marginalized groups still don't have access to anything. So it hurts because I really love this country, and I would have loved to be able to work there. Uh, and I don't know if we made the right choice, but what I'm sure of is that the aid has done more harm than good in North Korea in the past 18 years. Would you, would you agree with that? Like, 
so what we yeah because I mean it's a very good question because all the data was uh, quite biased so the way we realized that the needs were uh, and what made us leave North Korea <laughs> was actually to realize that the picture that our teams in North in North Korea was depicting was completely different from the picture that the refugees uh, at the Chinese border were uh, were showing and we have a long history of working with displaced you know we um, the, the first calls uh, against the uh, genocide in Cambodia, he came from the refugees. They are usually the best boys to uh, uh, convey the suffering and the violence that is happening uh, in a country. And so the way we knew about the humanitarian needs inside North Korea was actually that be, be, for, for many years we worked on the Sino-Korean border uh, with refugees providing assistance. A lot of people were going back and forth and they were we would see the health condition, we would provide them medical care, and they would also talk to us about the situation. And they would, they would explain us, I actually wrote a book, a book about it, which is a testimony of refugee. They would explain us the show and all the, the, the mise en scène, I don't know how you say that, when, uh, when the UN uh, delegates were doing a visit in the hospital, suddenly they were putting a, bags of rice and everything. It was completely orchestrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, and after, the bags were taken back, yeah. uh, and people wouldn't uh, even benefit from it. Yeah. So we had lots of testimonies from the refugees that uh, made us realize that uh, we were not in the right place. We were actually not helping the people. We were just manipulated as everybody. OK. We probably, is this a quick, short, Question. I think so. Yeah, okay, then. Yeah, Unless someone else has one. I, I don't want to monopolize. encourage you to take a bite to eat because I'm dragging you to our recording in here soon. So, you better. Is it a last yeah. quick question? Um, so, you've spoken a lot about advocacy. So, do you main, is advocacy mainly focused on ongoing crises and gaps as you see them, or do you also look into the future about potential crises that you may have to respond to? I'm thinking about like um, resistance to antibiotics, mm. for instance. Is that, some, is that a space that you're advocating in? Mm. Absolutely. So um, our op we have two kinds of advocacy. We have operational advocacy, mm. so, and this is very uh, in real time, very ad hoc. There is a need in the field. We have, we have no access. Imagine so the cartoon doesn't allow our people to uh, go into uh, the camps anymore. We're going to do a lot of advocacy training to reach the embassies, trying to leverage uh, for this very particular purpose. And it's going to be very practical. It is to respond to a need on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then there's a more long-term advocacy, which is in relation to access to medicine, mm -hmm. uh, to the field of R&D, etc., which we acknowledge may not have an immediate impact on the field, but it stems from a real issue, a lack, a gap, and uh, we know it might take years. The advocacy on malnutrition took us five years, actually. Um, and uh, we've been, uh, the, the advocacy to uh, uh, decrease the price of the first line uh, antiviral, antiretroviral treatment on HIV took almost 10 years, actually. Uh, decreased the price by 99%. It was long, long uh, advocacy. I think we should stop there. Um, thank you so much. It's been really